Hi everyone, my name is Atma and I'm the founder and CEO of Lotus Pay. We are an aggregator for NACH debit uh, and I will explain what NACH debit is. So we're going to talk about recurring payment collection methods. Uh, so this, this talk is focused on how businesses can collect recurring payments digitally in India. We'll cover what is NACH debit, why you should use it, how it works, and how to design the subscription logic that underlies the actual payment collection, the recurring payment collection, how you can actually get started, and what the customer's experience looks like. And also, at the end, we'll touch on how it compares to the other upcoming recurring payment collection method, which is UPI 2.0. So, traditionally, collecting recurring payments in India has been quite challenging uh, through uh, these, these existing methods. Paper-based paper NACH debit, this is like a physical mandate. Uh, it looks like a check. Uh, it's eight inches by three inches. It contains the customer's details and you need to take their signature. Once you've taken their signature, you send it to your bank, your bank sends it to the customer's bank. Customer's bank will verify the signature and activate the mandate. Then you start pulling money against it. So the log logistics of this is quite expensive and cumbersome. And there's up to a 27% signature mismatch rate. So paper-based NACH debit isn't great for most businesses. It's traditionally been used by the lending industry. Cards, cards are doing much better now. Uh, payment aggregators uh, have started to implement recurring payment methods uh, on standing instructions on cards. Uh, but they're still expensive. And also, uh, they have the challenge that cards do expire. They get lost. They get stolen. Uh, and... You know, when you're actually asking the customer, if it's, if it's not a standing instruction, if you keep asking the customer to pay, then you're also asking them to, you're also reminding them to cancel. So uh, a true recurring payment method is one that never asks the customer to pay on a, on a regular basis. Uh, the, there, there is an exception, as I mentioned. So some large utilities like Airtel or electricity companies, they do deep integration with banks and they take standing instructions on card. Uh, then there's payment gateways who are able to st uh, start doing standing instructions on credit cards. Uh, and the UPI is coming up for other push payment methods like wallets, UPI net banking uh, methods. So push payment methods requires the customer to initiate the transaction. Whereas NACH debit and UPI 2.0 truly are pool-based ba uh, payment methods. It's the, the business is pulling the money out of the customer's account. So what is NACH debit? It's a way to uh, get paid, keep getting paid, and it's easy, quick, and secure. It's an NPCI payment system, so most of you must be familiar with the National Payments Corporation of India. It's a private organization owned by the banks. Uh, it owns about half of the payment systems uh, in India, and all, all the payment systems are regulated, of course. Uh, NACH debit replaces ECS. So ECS has been around forever. NACH debit uh, replaces it uh, in, the, in the last couple of years uh, with a national clearing system. It basically means direct debit of a customer's bank account. It's been traditionally done on paper, as I mentioned, but now it's transitioning into an electronic mode. And there are about 30 or 33 banks today, in fact, who are live as e-mandates, uh, uh, as destination banks for e-mandates. And I'll explain what destination banks are. So the key features are that it's paperless. It is now paperless. There is there's still the paper method available, but now there's the e-mandate method available. Uh, it's the cheapest by far uh, payment, recurring payment collection method. In fact, I'd argue it's actually the cheapest uh, payment method uh, by far of, of recurring or non-recurring. It's very, very secure because it's a bank's payment system. It doesn't require any uh, aggregator as such, but there are aggregators like us who do it. It's, it's also great for customers because they just do a single initial authorization and that's it. That's their touch point. Then they forget about uh, their uh, recurring payment, uh, recurring bills, and you don't have to bother them. Uh, it's great for businesses because you can collect a variable amount or a fixed amount. You can do it regularly or irregularly. And uh, right now what's available is e-sign mandate, so it requires a digital signature, uh, which is uh, an Aadhaar e-sign. Created on the fly, I'll explain. Uh, but what's coming soon is another type of uh, NACH debit e mandate, and that's called the API e mandate, which is initiated uh, on the customer side by either validating through a debit card and PIN or through their net banking login. 
So this is coming soon. This is not ready yet, but that, it's called the API-based e-payment method. So what's available now is the e-sign-based uh, e-mandate. And it's good for businesses because you don't need to do uh, a lot of security work, especially if you're going through uh, an aggregator. So it's not great in all scenarios. Uh, let's, let's cover why, uh, when it's good and when it's not so good. It's great for high volume, small ticket payment collection. Uh, that's why it's been used by the lending industry traditionally. It can be used for any size, but uh, small ticket is particularly useful because of the ultra low cost. Uh, it's very, very secure because it's, it's a banking payment system. Uh, it, it pulls payments, so it doesn't require the customer to, author, uh, to, to push a payment. It has legal standing. Uh, what this means is that uh, it's, a, it's an electronic payment system, so it's covered under, payment, under the Payment and Settlement Systems Act, and uh, it's also covered under the Negotiable Instruments Act because it's a customer authorizing a debit of their bank account. And what that means is that under Section 138 of that Act, uh, the, the creditor, the business in this case, is afforded the legal protection uh, which is afforded to checks, for example. So if a customer defaults, uh, you have the, the right to uh, initiate legal proceedings. So it has a legal protection in that sense. It's mass market. You can use it with anyone because they just need a bank account. Uh, there's no smartphone required. It just requires uh, a signature from the customer, either physical signature or electronic signature. Uh, right now, it works with Aadhaar, so you can do it with consumers. Soon, with the uh, new API mandates, it'll also work with uh, corporates too. You can, one business can collect payments from another business. It's not great if you need instant confirmation. Uh, the other e-sign based mandates require some time for the destination bank to authorize the mandate and come back to you. It's not great for e-commerce because in e-commerce generally you require instant authorization. Uh, and it's not great for point of sale. So if a customer's in a shop and they want to do a recurring payment, it's not really suitable for that. Uh, it's not great for push payments. So it's, uh, it's, not, it's not easy to initiate it from the customer's end. Uh, it's traditionally easily initiated from the business's end. Uh, and it's not suitable for offering the customer a variety of payment methods because there is only one payment method here. Uh, it's NACH debit. So you, there's no underlying payment method. Like, for example, in the barred bill payment system, uh, that's, a, that's a, uh, a payment framework. It's not a payment system as such. It has underlying payment systems like uh, UPI, cards, etc. So uh, it's, it's, it only offers one way of actually uh, taking a payment through the bank account. And it's not great if you need to extend credit. Uh, like in a credit card, the customer can pay their bill every month. Uh, they don't actually need cash to make the payment. Here, you need cleared funds in the customer's bank account. So direct debit has been a very popular uh, payment method in Europe. In fact, in Europe, it's by far the uh, most popular way for consumers to pay their, uh, pay their bills. In the US, credit cards have been more popular. Uh, that's the, the culture there. And uh, uh, in India, we're seeing that, uh, that now UPI is kicking off. So uh, credit cards as a method for recurring payments haven't been so, pop so popular, mainly because of the second factor authentication requirement. Uh, RBI has recently been relaxing that policy, uh, but still it's... Uh, it's challenging because card penetration is quite low at, at the moment. Credit card penetration is at 4%. Uh, debit card penetration is quite high, but most consumers don't use debit cards for uh, recurring payments. So NACH debit is based on three pillars. The customer needs to have a bank account, obviously. Most customers have that. Uh, the customer needs to have either an Aadhaar uh, card. Now most people in India have that too. And they also need to have a, uh, if they're doing API-based e-mandates, then they need to have net banking login or uh, a debit card uh, with, with the PIN. So here, it's important to remember that the API-based e-mandate is being authorized by the debit card and PIN. It's not using the actual debit card uh, uh, payment uh, network like Visa, MasterCard, or Rupee to actually take the, the payment. It's just an authorization method for the NACH debit e-mandate. And they need a mobile phone to receive uh, the OTP, especially if they're going through uh, Aadhaar eSign. Now, the great thing is that most customers have all of these, like nearly everyone in India has these. And uh, by the end of March, everyone has to link these three things together. Uh, so the, the method that's available right now for NACH debit e-mandates is called Aadhaar eSign. Aadhaar eSign is simply a combination of Aadhaar, which is the uh, unique identity that an, in, an individual has, together with eSign, which is uh, operated by the CCA, 
and it's a method for do, uh, providing digital signatures which uh, come through a chain of hierarchy authorized ultimately by the government who issues the license to the CCA. CCA issues license to an e-sign uh, service provider. E-sign service provider issues uh, licenses to corporates. So what is Aadhaar e-sign? It's a temporary digital signature. It's an ad hoc digital signature. It's created on the fly. So it differs in that it doesn't require a customer to, for example, buy a, a digital si signature certificate uh, and store it on a USB. Uh, that's the kind of thing you can buy from, say, eMudra or, or Tata. But here, it's not really required. It's, it's generated on the fly. A customer needs to have, uh, so, so here, the customer needs to be an individual, as I mentioned, uh, because it requires an Aadhaar. Soon, uh, businesses can do it through the API-based e-mandate. Customer needs to have an Aadhaar. Uh, they need to have the mobile phone, which is linked to their Aadhaar, because they need to receive an OTP on it. Uh, they need to have a bank account, and the bank account should be with a live destination bank. There's some 30 banks. Uh, all the biggest banks are there, uh, except for a state bank. State bank is going to be live next month. So soon, uh, most of the customers in India will be uh, covered under uh, uh, NACH debit mandates, because they're banking with the banks that are already live. Um, and the maximum size of a, a single debit can be one lakh on e-mandates. On paper-based mandates, it's one crore, but this one lakh should increase uh, pretty soon. And the customer needs to have cleared funds in the bank account. What this means is that if the, if the funds aren't in the account at the time of the debit, the debit will fail, and uh, you'll be informed, and then you have to reattempt the debit or find out some other way of collecting the payment method, of collecting the, the, the payment amount. So if you want to do an ACH debit uh, collection, this is what you need to do. You need to integrate uh, with uh, the bank on one side, and you need to integrate with an e-sign service provider on the other side, uh, and then you need to collect information from your customer, uh, and you need to go through a data security audit, a cert in audit. So cert in is, is, a, uh, is a kind of a, a government body which uh, impanels various auditors, and those auditors will audit you to check that your data security is up to the mark. So uh, it's quite hard work. You need to do a lot of integrations. You need to build some uh, subscription logic. Uh, you need to figure out when to, uh, how to create the mandates, uh, how to authorize the mandates, then how to take the payments against that mandate, and then you need to reconcile the amount that's coming against that mandate, too. If you go through an aggregator, it's far simpler. Uh, there's just one integration required, uh, if you're the business. Uh, you integrate with your aggregator. The aggregator will receive the funds into their nodal account. A nodal account is a, it's like an escrow account. It's an account where uh, clients' funds, the, your funds, are segregated from uh, the aggregator's own operating uh, activities. And so the money coming in there is in the legal control of the bank. So the, this nodal account is owned by the bank. It's not open, owned by the aggregator. So the way this works is that you take your customers' details, uh, you pass that mandate to your sponsor bank. The sponsor bank is your bank. And then the sponsor bank will pass it through the NACH uh, e uh, electronic system. It's called the Mandate Management System, MMS, to the destination bank, which is the customer's bank. The customer's bank validates the mandate and comes back uh, as validated, and the payment flows in this direction too. So the advantages uh, of doing it through an aggregator is that you don't need to worry about all of this. And here you can just focus on uh, your sim single integration. Uh, and the banks, uh, the aggregator's already done deep integration with uh, the bank. They can intelligently route the mandates. They can uh, uh, negotiate better pricing uh, with e-sign providers and with banks. And uh, they have dedicated resources working on this. And the funds are in safe custody because of the nodal account. So what does the destination bank do? So when a customer signs a mandate, they are saying that the contents of the mandate is correct. But that doesn't actually mean that they are the person who owns the, the bank account mentioned in the mandate. That has to be verified by the destination bank. So when the mandate reaches the destination bank, they have a validation engine provided by one of the e-sign service providers. They uh, check that the, the person who digitally signed the mandate is the same person who owns the bank account contained in the mandate. That's the validation process. That's how a mandate gets activated, and therefore you can uh, start taking funds against that mandate. To get all this started, though, you need to have some underlying subscription logic. You need to have a billing system in place. You need to understand, okay, I have a plan. Against that plan, I need to, uh, I need to uh, invite a customer to uh, be on that plan, and then that link is called a subscription. Uh, so this subscription 
then has a mandate, that mandate can be through UPI or it can be UPI 2.0 or it can be through uh, NACH debit, uh, it can be through, say, a standing instruction on cards. Uh, then you need to uh, have the underlying bank account from which you're pulling funds. Uh, so then once you have this mandate set up, you need to pull the funds, so that's the debit, that's the, de the debit coming out of the customer's account. Then you need to uh, map that to your bank account, the credit, and then, uh, and so you need, you need the final object, which is your bank account. So all of these objects need to be coded in your uh, billing software. Uh, it's quite complex to get this right. Uh, and there are existing billing management systems which will do this for you. Uh, and there's also aggregators that, that uh, are getting into the space of subscription logic too. So payment aggregators are doing subscription logic. If you want to do this yourself, you need four things. You need a current account to be paid out to. Uh, you need the NACH debit product from your bank. It's a cash management uh, service offered by the banks. Uh, then you need to do uh, the SFTP. You need to have a file transfer method in order to uh, pass the e-mandates to your bank and to get the response files from your bank. And then you need to be uh, banking with a sponsor bank, a live sponsor bank for e-mandates. Uh, not, uh, not all banks are actually live as both destination banks and sponsor banks, but many of them are. So the large banks uh, are available as e-mandate sponsor banks. If you want to do it via an aggregator, you just simply need a current account to be paid out to. You don't need all these other things. You do need, uh, if you're going to do this yourself, you need a doc signer certificate, right? So a doc signer certificate is like a digital signature certificate, but it allows you as a, at the corporate level, it, it resides on the server, it's not, it doesn't reside on a USB token, and at the corporate level, it allows you to sign documents, various documents, like a PDF or an XML. In this case, it's an XML. Uh, the ASP setup is also uh, important because you need to get uh, authorized by an eSign uh, service provider as an eKYC user agency or as an application service provider. So you need to have one of these two setups with your eSign service provider. Okay. If, you, uh, if you're an application service provider, the, there's a redirect to the customer's, uh, to, to the eSign service provider, which we'll come on to. If you're an eKYC user agency, this is called a KUA. This means you have a license from the UIDAI in order to carry out Aadhaar authentication on your own server, then there's no redirect required. So you need to integrate with one of these eSign providers. There's only five in the country. So th these are the options available to you. As of a couple of weeks ago, eMudra was suspended. So uh, hopefully they'll come back online soon. Uh, but uh, you, you, need to, you need to get on board with one of, one of these eSign providers, either as a KUA, a KYC, EKYC user agency, or as an, an ASP, an application service provider. Okay, so here's the steps to actually uh, getting started with NACH debit. You need to prepare the mandate. So you need to source the customer's data, and we'll mention what data you need from the customer. You need to create an authorization URL. So this is a page, an HTML page, where the customer can go and see the, their details and confirm that, yes, this, these are my details. My, this is my bank account, this is my Aadhaar number, this is my name, and so on. The customer checks these details. They prepare a, uh, a so they check the details and they go through the e-sign process, which we'll come on to. Once they've done that, you have to prepare the uh, raw e-mandate XML. Right? That is a, a set of tags which contain all of the customer's data. You base64 encode this XML, th this, this string, and you, can, you hash it using a hashing algorithm. That hashing algorithm, that, that hash then goes into the request XML, which is separate to the mandate XML. That request XML uh, you send to the eSign gateway. And that's the integration that you should have done by now. It's important to remember here that you can actually ask the customer to enter their own details on this kind of confirmation page. Uh, so it could be like a form and then a confirmation page. This is a bit risky because customers can make mistakes. Uh, you need to get things pretty right. Uh, you need to get their uh, Aadhaar number right. You need to get their bank account details correct. Otherwise, you know, the, this whole part will be successful. They'll go through the e-sign process, but you'll only find out uh, after the destination bank has responded that there's some mistake, like say that the account number was wrong. So it's best if you, as a process, you're collecting this data from your customer and you're just simply showing them a confirmation page where they carry out the e-sign. You have to take the, uh, this raw mandate contents. It includes these details. So you need to have your, your sponsor bank's details. You need to have 
your name. Uh, you need to have an NACH utility code which allows you to participate in, in the NACH payment system. If you don't have this utility code, you can use the aggregator's utility code, uh, but then it's the aggregator's name that will appear on the customer's bank statement. If you don't want that to happen, then you need to get your own utility code. A, a good aggregator can do this for you in, in a day or two. Uh, and this code basically entitles you to participate. Therefore, it's your bank account, uh, it, it's your name appearing on the customer's bank account statement, uh, and it's you that's afforded the legal protection, uh, the Section 138 protection that I, I mentioned earlier. Now, uh, you also need the customer's bank account details. You need the IFSC code, account number, uh, the account type, a savings or, or a current account, and you need uh, uh, the start date and end date of the mandate. You need the frequency, whether it's monthly, weekly, whether, whether it's ad hoc or, or quarterly, uh, and the amount. The amount can be a fixed amount or it can be a maximum amount under which you can, uh, the limit within which you can debit. Uh, you need the customer's Aadhaar number, and there are two reference fields where you can enter your custom uh, uh, data, like your customer ID number or your subscription reference number. The request XML contains uh, the hash that I mentioned. It contains the algorithm type that was used to, to create that. And it, requires, it contains the authorization type. So in Aadhaar eSign, there's two, two ways of doing Aadhaar eSign, biometric or OTP. Uh, NACH debit only uses the OTP method. Uh, and right now, it's only uh, pre-verified no. Uh, and you need a response URL. So once the customer goes to the eSign gateway and signs, where is that customer going to come back to? So uh, a URL for your website. Um, you need to have your digital signature, the, the, the doc signer that you use to sign that mandate, with, along with the certificate. And you need to have the customer's Aadhaar number. So the customer uh, visits this page. They check their details. They click on proceed. And then they're redirected to the eSign service provider. This only happens if you are an ASP. If you're a KYC user agency, uh, then you don't need to do the redirect. You can do this process on your own server. To get this license is a bit challenging right now. You need to go through a process with uh, UID AI. And you have to pay quite a big fee. It's about 20 lakhs uh, bank guarantee, another 25 lakhs in annual cost. So most, most uh, companies, most SMEs won't be able to do this. Uh, many of the large companies have already done this for other reasons, and therefore they can take advantage uh, of, of this. Uh, the customer reads the resident consent. Uh, they're authorizing the creation of that temporary digital signature. They request an OTP. It comes on their mobile phone uh, as an SMS, and they punch that in, uh, and they uh, hit, hit submit, and that uh, confirms. They get a confirmation that the uh, e-sign was successful. And then you, uh, they go back to your redirect URL. So in the back, uh, that's at the front, but in the back, this is what's happening. You're getting uh, a response uh, from your eSign gateway. Uh, the, and, and you need to use that response to code up your final e-mandate, the one that you're actually submitting to the bank. The final e-mandate contains the raw mandate data. It contains the signed content. Uh, it contains the gateway's certificate and the gateway's signature. The signature contains the hash, which verifies the contents of the mandate. Once you've submitted this to your bank, so you do this via SFTP, uh, your bank will uh, check it. They will validate that it uh, conforms to the, the, the overall requirements of uh, NACH debit e-mandates. They will upload it to the mandate management system. Right? All the banks have integrated, all the sponsor banks have integrated with the mandate management system uh, of NACH. This is when your unique mandate reference number gets generated. Uh, at this point. All that they're saying is that the mandate has been submitted. It's not that the mandate is live yet. The destination bank checks the, then it reaches the destination bank. Uh, the destination bank then has two days to respond, either to say, yes, it's a valid mandate, or no, it's not. Um, and then they can, they can give the active or, or reject uh, status. And the sponsor bank gets that status back, uh, and then they inform you uh, about what their status is. So. Once the mandate is active, then you need to start pulling funds against that mandate. Okay? Uh, if you are going through an aggregator, that pulling of funds can be automated. So if, for example, you're, you're a gym and you want to collect 5,000 rupees a month, uh, but you know that, okay, on the fifth of each month, we need to collect 5,000 rupees from this customer, then you don't want to worry about, uh, okay, on the fourth of the month, I have to remember to send a debit file to pull the funds. So if you're using an aggregator, they will have hopefully built the subscription logic, which allows uh, you to forget about that. If it's an automated, if it's a fixed amount monthly, you don't need to worry about the automation part of it. If it's a variable amount, um, for example, say uh, a mobile phone bill, which varies, a postpaid bill, which varies from month to month, uh, then uh, you need to, you as the business need to inform 
uh, the, uh, the bank or aggregator how much you want to debit each month. Once you submitted this uh, bulk transaction file, the sponsor bank validates it, submits it. Uh, the destination bank will respond by the end of the day, and you will, be, uh, you will receive one single bulk payment. So suppose you submitted 100, 100 uh, debit requests in one batch file, uh, and each one is for, say, uh, 1,000 rupees. And if they're all successful, at the end of the day, you'll get a single payment of 1 lakh rupees into your bank account. Uh, then you need to figure out how to reconcile that 1 lakh rupees settlement and payout amount with the 100 debit requests that you sent. So this reconciliation process can be a bit complicated if you're doing it on your own. If you're doing it with an aggregator, then they will have um, built this into the subscription logic. So here are some of the advantages that we see when you're going through an aggregator. They will automate this billing process for you. They will have done the whole subscription logic. Uh, it will help you to improve your cash flow if, if you're using any kind of recurring payment methods that does not require a customer to authorize every subsequent payment. Uh, remember what I said. If, you, if you're asking the customer to authorize a subsequent payment, a recurring payment, you're also reminding them to cancel. So uh, uh, it, it improves the cash flow. It reduces the churn. It also means that you don't have to keep chasing your customers for payment. Many businesses in India right now are literally having like salespeople or support people call their customers every month for payment. Uh, and and that's, uh, you know, there's a real cost to that. You can integrate this with your existing workflow uh, in your system. Uh, and it improves the customer's experience because they just need to do a single initial authorization after which they can just forget about it. Uh, and for you, it's great pricing. Uh, it's much better pricing than any, any other payment system. So what are the use cases? Uh, if you are in the financial services industry, then you w might want to collect recurring payments for uh, SIPs or if, on the... On the uh, liability side, on the asset side, if you are uh, a lender, for example, then you need to collect uh, EMIs. So it, it, this is the best case, use case by far. In fact, 90% uh, of NACH debit uh, mandates are for the financial services industry. Slowly, though, it's being expanded into other industries. It's great for the technology industry to collect SaaS payments, for example, subscription payments, um, and all these other industries um, and their respective uh, recurring payment collection requirements. How does this compare to uh, the, payments, the other payment system, like payment gateways? So if you go through a payment gateway, uh, regardless of whether it's a push-based payment or a pull-based recurring payment, uh, you, need to, uh, you need to pay some fees, uh, which are generally going to be percentage-based fees, especially if it's a, a card. In fact, all, 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 the payment system, all the underlying payment systems offered by payment gateways have a percentage-based fee. Uh, the, uh, say if it's a debit card, or uh, it might be around 1%. Credit cards will be 2 to 3%. Uh, UPI will be just under 1%. Net banking payments will be just under 1%. So you're paying a percentage fee. It's a sliding scale. So if, for example, you're taking 1,000 rupees, that 1% is 10 rupees. But if you're taking a 1 lakh rupees, then it goes up accordingly. So the point here is that uh, NACH debit, it doesn't matter how big the payment is. You pay a fixed fee. It's literally... X rupees to create a mandate, and Y rupees to take the debit. doesn't matter how, much, how big the debit is. Uh, and so th there may be some other maintenance fees as well. Right? So banks will charge you a setup fee to get started with NACH debit, and aggregators should not. NACH debit is by far the cheapest payment collection method for recurring payments. Uh, this is a simple kind of uh, illustration. It's, it's quite oversimplified. Uh, it uses kind of, you know, a little bit of internal analysis. But if you're trying to collect, say, 5,000 rupees from a customer on a recurring basis, and you're doing it by cash, the true cost of that cash collection is actually quite high because you need to move the cash around. You need to keep uh, reminding the customer to pay. You need to get your sales and support people to go and physically collect that cash. So the true cost of it is quite high. So this incorporates the labor cost, the logistics cost, the transportation cost, uh, and, and the, the lost interest and so on. So productivity loss. So if, you, if you're under, trying to understand the total cost to, to your business for doing something, for doing a recurring payment collection by various payment methods, this gives you an idea. Okay? Now, UPI fits in uh, around the 150 mark, uh, just, just before NACH. UPI on uh, version 2.0 with recurring payment mandates will still have this uh, MDR concept. So uh, it's still going to cost you a little bit more than an ACH debit because it's still a percentage fee. Right? The, the, the cheapest method by far will be an ACH debit. And if you're doing it on paper, there's still the logistic cost. But if you're doing it on uh, electronic mode through e-sign or API-based e-mandates, 
that is literally by far the cheapest recurring payment method by, uh, available. And remember, uh, these other payment methods are push-based payment methods, right? You, the customer has to push the money. Uh, and it's debit and UPI 2.0 are pool-based payment methods. This, this is a bit old. I didn't have time to update this. This is from June, but it gives you an idea of kind of the, the volumes uh, in play in different payment systems. Uh, NHS debit is kind of in the middle of the back of the pack. UPI, I think it's grown significantly since June. It's probably around 100, crore, uh, 100, million, dollar, uh, 100 million rupees, sorry, 100 billion rupees mark. Uh, so it's still kind of, uh, it's probably just surpassed wallets. Uh, but you can see that there's a significant volume of recurring payments going, this is not just for recurring payments, this is for all payments, but there's a significant volume of recurring payments going through other payment systems which could be uh, consumed within true recurring payment systems, UPI 2.0 and NACH debit and card standing instruction. So how do the two compare? NACH debit uh, is a pool-based payment method. There is actually a way of doing it by a push if it's uh, the customer initiating the mandate. It's not such a popular way of doing it because the customer has to go and get that paper or that form and they have to push it. On, on uh, e-sign mandates, other e-mandates, it's always pull. It, the, you have to create the mandate. Uh, whereas with UPI, the customer can initiate, uh, UPI 2.0, the customer can initiate the mandate. You can say, okay, I voluntarily want to pay this business or this other UPI user X thousand rupees per month. The cost structure on NACH debit is a fixed fee. So it's an absolute fee, a rupee fee, per mandate and a rupee fee per debit. Whereas with UPI, it's a percentage fee. So it's gonna be more expensive. Uh, NHS debit isn't great if you need instant confirmation. Uh, so it's going to require two days, up to two days to actually authorize the mandate. That time period is actually coming down. A good aggregator can uh, get it done for you in a day. Uh, and uh, one day, one business day to get the actual debit, right? So you submit the debit request in the morning and by the evening, you should get the fund. The funds come into the bank. The bank may take its own sweet time to pay you out, but uh, a good aggregator will pay you out the same day. Uh, the, uh, on the other hand, if you're using UPI and you're doing bulk collection, so bulk collection via UPI is actually a product offered by banks. You don't need to go through an aggregator, but uh, aggregator will have solved a lot of the tech problems for you. But if you're doing bulk collection via UPI, uh, there's two ways of doing it. Right? One is that you're actually sending out uh, individual UPI pull requests uh, the customer pays you and you're getting like literally thousands of debits coming to your account and you have to figure out how to reconcile those against uh, your subscription logic. Uh, a better way would be to do it by a bulk payment where you get one payment at the end of the day and then you can just reconcile that against the individual debit request. Uh, if you're trying to set this up, you can do it through a bank or aggregator in both cases. Uh, but with, if you're doing it with uh, uh, NACH debit, you need to have the e-sign uh, service if you're not going via an aggregator. So, Revocability is an important concept here. Uh, it's not the same as canceling, right? I mean, you can ca even a customer can cancel an NACH debit mandate or uh, a UPI 2.0 mandate. Right? Both can be canceled by the customer. The difference is about revocability, whether they're allowed to cancel the mandate, whether legally they were meant to cancel the mandate. So uh, technically, uh, an NACH debit mandate should not be canceled by the customer unless they've taken the business's permission to cancel it. Right? So if, for example, the business is a lender and they're taking uh, uh, an EMI payment against a, an outstanding debt, then the customer has no right to cancel that mandate. They can, but they have no right to do so. If they do that, then it's, that's a Section 138 default. Right? Uh, whereas with UPI, uh, it, it can be canceled by the mandate and it is revocable by, uh, by the customer, sorry, and it, and it is revocable by them. So it's not great for lending products. UPI 2.0 will not be a great legal uh, will not afford great legal protection for lending businesses. Uh, the customer requires a bank account uh, in, in both cases. Uh, they need a mobile phone in the case of uh, NACH debit. In the case of UPI 2.0, they need a smartphone, not just a, a mobile phone, they need a smartphone. They need to install a UPI app on it. So uh, that penetration is, is much less than uh, just simple mobile penetration. So with NACH debit, you can receive the mass, uh, the bottom of the pyramid. You can literally take money from anyone's bank account. Whereas uh, with NACH debit, it only works if that customer owns a smartphone and has a UPI app, and they've created a, a VPA. So they need a VPA. That's the, that's the one thing you need from a customer in the case of uh, UPI 2.0 uh, e-mandates. 
from, from the NSH debit point of view, you need to get their bank account details and their other number. If you go through an aggregator for NSH debit, uh, they will be able to provide you with dashboards and APIs that uh, solve a lot of the subscription logic problem, right? Uh, if you don't want them to do the subscription logic part of it, then you just need the e-mandate creation pull money, the pull debit request, the, the, de the debit transaction request, and you need to understand how you to reconcile the payouts against the actual debit request. Okay? So you need an API or a dashboard to reconcile this, uh, and, and an aggregator should provide all three of these things. So if you want to get started with NACH debit, uh, if you want to do it yourself, then you have to go via bank. So you have a current account with your bank, you have to go to that your RM and ask them for the cash management product known as NACH debit, and then you need to do SFTP integration with your bank. Uh, this alone will take, you know, you, you hope it'll take weeks, but it'll take months. Um, you need a doc signer certificate from an e-sign service, uh, from an e-sign authorized license, licensee. You also need to do an e-sign integration. Uh, and you need to undergo an audit from a certain impaneled auditor, data security auditor. Uh, you need to create the mandate and figure out how to do that. So you need to actually code that up. Then you need to build in your subscription logic to link that mandate creation with your billing system and, and subscription system. And then you need to undergo NACH certification to be actually allowed to participate in the NACH system. If you do it by an aggregator, you just need an API. So in summary, NACH debit is great for recurring payments collection. Uh, it's cheaper, more secure, and it has better reach than other payment systems. Uh, it's, uh, it has a different use cases uh, compared to standing instructions on cars, and UPI uh, version 2.0, uh, and uh, you might want to consider using an aggregator. That's all I have for you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much.